Hey, this is Andrew Reversa with Impact Soundworks. And in this video, we're going to be continuing our look at Super Audio Kart Retro Game Samples, this time at the Modulation Matrix and the Effects Racks, which are some of the most advanced and powerful features in this instrument. If you missed the previous two videos, I would definitely recommend watching those first, because otherwise, you might be a little confused at uh, some of these features that I'm going to be talking about. As before, I'm starting with just a simple initialized patch. To access the effects racks, there are these three tabs along the bottom. And we're going to switch from main to effects. And now when you click on any of these, instead of switching views for the uh, editing, like here, you're getting the advanced tabs here. If you're within effects, you're switching what effects rack is being edited, of course. So from top to bottom, we have a nice four band parametric EQ. It's very useful for sculpting a sound as well as uh, certain sound design uses. This button here will randomize the parameters. So if you click this, it randomizes the EQ settings. Another nice feature is that you can alt and click on this here, and this will reset all the parameters to normal. Moving on, we've got the compressor. This is an analog model, sort of SSL style compressor that Native Instruments has in some of their other products. And to best demonstrate this, I've switched to an SNES drum kit. The nice thing is that you can adjust the mix of the compressor here. Uh, you can have a very extreme setting, but mixed at 50-50, you get that nice sort of New York style parallel compression. The bit crusher allows you to control bit depth from 16 bits down to one bit, and then the sample rate from 44 kilohertz down to 50 hertz. Uh, it does not sound too good, but this being a retro chiptune library, it's very useful to be able to control these settings. Sometimes you want to add more grit to some of these sounds. this, you can take a relatively clean SNES or Genesis sample, and you can sort of take it to a different generation or era. For the Genesis, it's actually particularly useful because uh, the Genesis model that we sampled was the Model 1, which was uh, more clean. And some of the other models had a little bit more of that lo-fi sound. So for example, if we pull up that sound, for example, the uh, Michael Pick, this is clean then you can adjust the bit depth, just get a little bit more of that grit, which may be what you're looking for. Noise introduces constant noise, and noise color adjusts the frequency via low pass filter. Scream is a guitar pedal type distortion effect. It can get pretty extreme, so you wanna be careful when you're using this. Drive is going to control the overall volume of the effect, how much is going into the overdrive effect. Then tone controls the frequency balance of uh, the overdrive. Bass and bright then affect uh, the balance, but in a different way than tone, it's sort of the pre-frequency balance. So where tone gives a more audible effect on the output, bass and bright control how it's being driven. It's not necessarily as obvious and noticeable. Mix controls the dry wet balance of the effect, but interestingly enough, even at zero, it still has some sort of an effect. That's just how it's programmed. Then we have a nice tempo synced delay, which goes up to triplet 30 second notes and down to whole note delay. Now on a layer by layer basis, mix affects the dry wet mix. So if I turn this all the way to wet or towards wet, then you're actually just hearing the echoes. Whereas if I'm on all dry, you're hearing mostly dry with just a little bit of delay. On the other hand, for global delay, uh, this is wet added to the dry signal. So it's never gonna mix down the dry signal at all. That's something to keep in mind when you're doing layer effects versus global effects. 
Damping affects the amount of filtering applied to the echoes over time. Pan is the width of the echoes and feedback is how much the delay effect is fed back into itself. Now, SNES verb is another kind of delay, but it's been modified and tweaked in terms of the settings to best emulate the sort of faux reverb effect that many SNES games used. And what better way to demonstrate it than with an SNES sound like a harp? Let's turn on the effect. You can control the time, which is pretty low even at max value, as well as the level, the width, and feedback. This is pretty much a must-have if you're doing any sort of classic SNES-style music. Then we have a traditional reverb effect, which is convolution-based. And there is a set of impulse responses that we created for the library, ranging from normal halls, like a concert hall, to small rooms, like the light hall live room here. These have pretty minimal tails. And then there's some more effect style reverbs like Cosmic. You can adjust the frequency range of the convolution effects here, although it's not real time. So this actually reprocesses the loaded impulse response. So you can't automate these knobs. Likewise with size, this controls the length of the reverb from 50% of normal length to 150%. It takes a second to update, and then the wet amount, which is pretty straightforward. Lastly, there is a simple brick wall limiter effect. So you can drive the signal into this, control the release of the limiter, and the final output. In many of our patches, we use multiple effects racks. So in this one, intergalactic exploration. There's a lot of stuff going on. On the global rack, we have delay and reverb, as well as EQ and compression. Layer A, let's see, has SNES verb, uh, which is actually useful for adding stereo to any sound that's normally mono. And layer B has some delay. C also has delay, and D also has delay. Probably different syncs, different mixes. So doing any kind of advanced sound design with Super Audio Cart, you'll definitely want to use the effects racks. Here's another patch. This is a uh, patch with no effects at all, Castle of Questing. <laughs> using all Game Boy sounds. Uh, now just using some simple effects here, we can pretty dramatically change the character. So first let's do uh, some SNES verb for width. And we can do that maybe on the on sort of the lead sound. So that's now nice and wide. Now here's the bass line. Let's go ahead and scoop this a little bit and get rid of those high frequencies. And boost the bass here using the EQ. And we could also bit crush this further. And because the triangle is now a little bit quieter, we'll turn it up. Now for the noise. Let's add a compressor to make it even punchier. So with 10 milliseconds of attack time, that's gonna let the transients through, but not much else. And 
And on the global channel, we can also bring out some reverb. This is just a really fun patch to play, honestly. We also put some scream on the percussion. And adjust this a little bit, turn down the drive, the bass, and put a limiter on it. Those are just some of the things you can do with the effects racks. Now let's move on to the modulation matrix. This was an incredible feat of software engineering on the part of our lead engineer, Nabil Ansari. So he definitely gets uh, pretty much all the credit for this implementation of the modulation matrix. You might've seen things like this in other synthesizers and plugins, but to do it in contact required a lot of custom work. And uh, it's really very, very powerful. The mod matrix allows you to connect any one of various modulators, such as MIDI CCs, or velocity, or key press, the XY pad, or generated LFOs, and link it to just about any parameter on any layer, or all layers. And you can set up up to 64 different modulators and destinations in a single patch. In the initialized patch, CC1, which is the mod wheel, is routed at maximum depth to the vibrato amount on all layers. So if I play a note, there you go. I get increasing vibrato amount as I move the mod wheel. I could change this to, let's say, constant, in which case there is going to be a 100% vibrato amount all the time. By adjusting the modulation depth, you control how much the modulator is sending to that destination. But let's say you want to add some extra vibrato in some way, and you want to have total control over that. You can add an LFO and then assign it to, let's say, layer A, general, and fine tuning. This is essentially a vibrato that's happening at all times, but it gives you more control over the LFO shape, as well as the frequency, tempo sync, and how the LFO is triggered. So we'll get into all these things individually, but just sort of right off the bat, let's see what this does. Right now it's a slow LFO. You can turn that up to 20 hertz. Or we could tempo sync it, which could be very useful depending on what you're doing. Now to keep going, uh, what I'm gonna do is instantiate a filter on this layer. So let's do, how about the ARLP4, sounds good. And we'll clear our mod matrix for now. And let's add another layer as well. And how about for this layer, we'll do a bandpass. For the third layer, why don't we do some pulse width modulation? But we'll make this envelope a little bit different. So now this layer is pretty percussive and it's going away after you press the note. Okay, so there is our basic sound. And let's run through what some of these other features are. Once again, going back to LFO for a second, all modulators have a depth control and that controls to what extent the modulator affects the destination. So at 100%, that's 100% of the distance from the minimum value of the knob to maximum. And let's say we want to affect layer A's filter. In this case, since the cutoff is already at 50%, that's the base value, we'll set the mod depth to 50%. And for the shape, we could do a triangle wave. And then the sync will turn on tempo syncing with the host. And this can be set to, let's say, 16ths. And the trigger, free versus note, if it's on free, then the LFO runs at all times, whereas with note, it will re-trigger when you press a note for the first time. You'll hear what that sounds like in a minute, but let me set up the routing first. So here you can select what layer or whether it's a global parameter is being affected. Since we don't want to affect the layer B filter, we can do layer A and then go to filter from the list of destination categories and cut off. Okay, so there you go. LFO modulation to cut off, pretty straightforward. If we switch this to global, then it's going to affect all filters. 
But for now, we just want it to affect layer A. And let's slow down the sync on this to quarter notes. But you notice every time I'm pressing a note, it's coming in at a different point in the LFO. If you want to change that, switching it to note is the way to go. Now, every time I press a note for the first time, it's going to restart at the same point in the LFO waveform. However, if you're playing multiple notes, then the LFO is just going to continue. The difference between a unipolar LFO and a bipolar can be best illustrated if we go back to the main page for a second. Let's set this to filter cutoff on layer B, and we'll give it otherwise the same settings as the first modulator. So note, we can set it to triangle, 50% looks good. Now let's watch the cutoff here. And notice layer A, it's going both above 50% and below 50%. Whereas with layer B, it's going at the base value of 50% up only. So unipolar only goes in one direction. You can also have a negative mod depth. So in this case, for the LFO, it's going to go down from 50%. As you see the controls animating, you might be wondering how to change the base value. And the answer to that is actually pretty simple. You just move the knob however you want. So you can set that back to 50. You can set this to maybe 60 or 70%. And that changes the base value. Even if a knob is moving, you can still grab it and move it. Although it's generally better to do that when you're not pressing a note, just so you can see what you're doing. Among the other LFO shapes is the random shape, which is very useful for a filter, and I'll show you why. Let's solo this layer for a second. This basically snaps to random values on every sync. So if we switch this to something a little bit faster, how about 16th? It's actually a really cool effect that we use in some of our patches. So keep that waveform in mind because it can do a lot of fun stuff. And let's switch the cutoff a little bit lower and increase the resonance. <laughs> Moving on, we have MIDI controlled modulators. So there's CC, which is pretty straightforward, but instead of vibrato this time, let's set this for all layers to affect the filter resonance. So I'm going to play a note and it will increase the resonance. Or let's say if those values are too extreme too quickly, we can turn that down to just 30%. And maybe 50%. That sounds good. And to protect our ears, let's turn on a limiter. Always a good idea. Next up, we have velocity controlled parameters. This simply modulates whatever parameter you choose based on the last velocity you hit. Let's say we want to do something with layer C now. I had set sustain to zero, but what if we want this to sustain based on how hard you hit the note? So we'd go to C, volume, ADSR, sustain, and we'll turn this up to max depth. And let's just solo that layer so we can hear what's going on. The key modulator will send a modulation signal based on what key you play on the keyboard. The low notes will send lower values and the high notes will send higher values, or the reverse of that if you switch the mod depth to negative. Let's say we want to pan layer B based on what key is hit. So we can turn down the pan and then add a key modulator to just layer B, general panning. You can see based on what key I hit, the pan is changing. Moving on, we have the pitch bend controller. So normally this is attached to pitch. But if we turn the pitch bend range down to zero, let's link all layers so it affects everything. Now pitch bend, if you look down here, it's not doing anything. So instead we could have this effect, for example, layer A's volume. 
There's also Aftertouch, if your keyboard supports it. In this case, uh, I took away the CC1 modulator for vibrato, so we could map vibrato to Aftertouch instead. How about general vibrato amount? I'm going to play a chord and then push the keys very hard. Moving on, you can use the XY pad over here and link that to pretty much any parameter of your choice except for itself. I've added an Atari 2600 noise sound. We'll turn on the arpeggiator and let's give it some short notes here. And using the key tracking off feature, we can make it the same exact pitch regardless of where you play on the keyboard. We'll swap it to an LP2 filter and turn down the cutoff. So basically you can't really hear it. We can use the XY pad to control the timbre of just that layer. So how about on the X axis, we'll do filter cutoff. And on the Y axis, we can control the volume of that layer. Or we could add an LFO, how about a sine wave, very gradual, maybe a whole measure, set to modulate the global x, y, x position. And we'll start the x here and see what happens. Already a very cool sound, just using 11 slots of the mod matrix. The last three are fairly simple. The random unipolar just sends a random value every time you play a note. Going back to resonance for a second, let's say we switch this to random unipolar. Each time a note is played, it'll send a random value to resonance. Let's turn off layer D and then look at layer B as an example. The value changes every time I play a note. Random bipolar is the same, except it can also go negative from the base value that you select. And then lastly, there's constant, which just sends a constant value to whatever parameter you pick. This is actually particularly useful if, for example, you wanna change the volume of all layers, but not lose the relative volume to one another. Before I do this though, you'll notice that volume is not on the list of destinations. And that's because right now the mod matrix only allows one modulator for each destination. So you could have key or velocity control many different things, but you can't have filter cutoff controlled by five different modulators, for example. So for this to work, I deleted one volume modulator and I'll delete the other one here. Go back up. And now I can control all layers at once. Most of the destinations are otherwise pretty self-explanatory. You have things like sample offset, vibrato amount and speed, pitch, all the different effects parameters. Uh, but there are a couple things I want to mention, some interesting tidbits. One is that you can control the amount of send to the global reverb and delay. Send is how much is fed into the effect as opposed to the effect volume. So let's say I go to reverb, send, and we connect this to CC1. Now, normally, if we were just controlling the effect volume, then reducing the volume would kill the effect. But here you can see as I'm moving the mod wheel, even though it's preventing new reverb from happening, it'll keep any reverb tails that have already been processed. So it's very useful, for example, if you want to have delay ring out on one note, but then not have any delay for subsequent notes. Another thing is that you can use the modulation matrix to get free running oscillators. And here's what I mean by that. Let me go ahead and initialize the mod matrix. And actually let's just initialize the whole patch. Now I'm gonna load the same sound source on all four layers. Okay, Commodore 64 saw, here we go. Even though there are four different layers here, and even if I pan these separately, it will still sound mono. And that's because the waveforms are playing back perfectly in phase every time I play a note. So I could adjust the sample offset. 
manually like this. You just sort of hope that it sounds good. But the easier way to do it would be to return these to a normal value and use the mod matrix. Random unipolar, max depth, and then A through D, sample offset. The reason we're not using global is because if I set it to global offset, then it will send the same value to all four offset knobs. So now when I play a note, we get true free phase every time. And now you can also hear the panning difference between the different layers. So that covers my three-part tutorial series on Super Audio Cart. If you'd like to see more information about the library, you can click in the video description below. And I also plan on making more videos in the future, depending on what information people are looking for. I also definitely recommend that you check out our extensive factory library to see how we used many of these advanced features, uh, particularly in the pads, arpeggios, and sequences. They really tie everything together. Anyway, this has been Andrew Versa. Thank you for watching these videos, and I hope you enjoy Super Audio Cart.